Okay, now I'd like to partially introduce um, Leith Greenslade, uh, who will begin speaking very soon. And then I will drop yeah, off and see yeah, if I can deal with the Eventbrite problem, uh, if there is one. Um, Leith runs the Every Breath Counts Coalition, and every Monday she has 100 people from all over the world talk about the global demand for medical devices. I personally believe Leith knows more than anyone in the entire world about the global demand for medical devices. Um, if you don't know Leith, the other great thing about her is that she elevates every meeting that she's in. Every meeting that she's in, she makes it like a plus five meeting. Um, and she's been great organizing this. Now, um, Public Invention is a nonprofit and we, we get volunteers to invent things for us. We normally don't pay anyone who works for public invention. Um, and so generally speaking, the volunteers don't really get anything except satisfaction. But occasionally they get something else. They get a little plaque like this. Like this, which I am now presenting to Leith Greenslade. It says, in special recognition for Respiricon 2 and Organizing Global Demand 2021. Um, so um, thank you very much, Lee. And uh, if you could please go ahead and begin your talk. And I'm going to uh, talk to my people and, and sort out the event right issue if there is one. Terrific. Thank you. Rob, and thank you for that award. Very unexpected, but uh, very, very uh, uh, grateful to receive it. Um, I'm going to start sharing uh, my screen. There we go. Okay, so thank you, Public Invention, for what I hope is a milestone conversation over these next two days. We'll only know when we face another pandemic if what we do here will truly change anything. But let's give it everything we've got over the next two days. I am not from the open source community. I lead a coalition of about 60 organizations who have been working together since March 2020 to help countries get the supplies they need to treat COVID-19 patients. And over those two years, I've watched first with fear, then with horror, and finally outrage at what has unfolded. We hear a lot about vaccine inequity, but today we're talking about respiratory care inequity, its tragic consequences, and what we might be able to do about it for next time. I wanna start the conversation with a question that you don't really hear asked. I suspect because too many heads would roll if we actually answered it. Just how many of the 6 million official COVID deaths and the 25 million more unreported could have been prevented with better access to respiratory care? You know what I'm talking about. Pulse oximeters, oxygen, patient monitors, ventilators, and all of the PPE needed to use them properly. I can tell you now that nobody knows the answer to this question, nobody. What we do know is that the countries with the highest COVID-19 death rates have struggled the most to treat patients effectively. This photograph tells the story. Just one example of the immeasurable suffering that individuals and families all across the world have endured these past two years. This particular photo was taken in Peru, which has the world's highest COVID-19 case fatality rate. In June 2020, the tragedy began to unfold. Do you remember images of Peruvians lining up to fill oxygen cylinders after hospitals ran out? Sometimes sleeping overnight, like the person in this photo, as their loved ones clung to life at home, waiting for them to return. Forced to pay their entire monthly salaries for just one cylinder of oxygen that might last 24 hours. 
I feel helpless, angry, and furious. I feel like my hands are tied. My father is sick and we can't afford something that is so essential for him to survive. That was Marcella Puisson in Peru, who was taking care of her 60 year old father at home with her six siblings. And she was talking about oxygen. Who can ever forget India in May, 2021? The images of patients in parking lots of hospitals or on the back seats of cars suffocating to death as their loved ones searched frantically for respiratory care. It got so bad that doctors took to social media to beg for help. Since 4.30 a.m., we have been trying to get oxygen. We have young patients who will die in a matter of two hours. I request, please send oxygen to us. We need oxygen for our patients. Please send it to us. They will die. They need oxygen. We can save them, please. That was Dr. Gautam Singh from a 100 bed hospital in New Delhi on Twitter, and he was crying. And just a short time after, in July 2021, Mateto Sinjani lost his uncle in a Malawi hospital when they couldn't locate a 28 millimeter spanner to fill an oxygen cylinder. After a valiant effort to locate a spanner from his own workplace, Mateto returned to the hospital, but not in time. When the doors of the elevator opened, I heard cries and I could hear my aunt's voice. I walked through the corridor and saw my other uncle sitting outside crying. He told me, you have tried your best, Mateto. I kneeled with the right spanner in my hand and knew that was the end of it. That's how I lost my beloved uncle and may his soul continue resting in peace. This is the same Mateto who will be doing a live demonstration for us this weekend. He is part of the amazing Open02 team in Malawi. These are just three examples from Latin America, Asia and Africa, and there are millions more. How could this have happened? We were not searching for new technologies. The respiratory care devices needed to keep COVID patients alive are pretty standard but it was the sheer size of the demand by so many countries at the same time that exposed massive cracks in the current system of designing, manufacturing and distributing respiratory care supplies. In November, 2020, the Every Breath Counts Coalition joined forces with two NGOs, PATH and the Clinton Health Access Initiative, which is known by its acronym CHI, to build an online tool to estimate the daily needs of oxygen of COVID patients in low and middle income countries. So anyone could find out who had an internet connection. Why? Because there were no official numbers. Can you believe it? Oxygen has been described by the World Health Organization as an essential medicine for years, but no one knew how much countries were producing or how much they would need to treat COVID patients. So they couldn't see the large gaps that existed in most countries. This is a picture of the tracker data since launch. You can see the India Delta spike in May 2021. And look now, Omicron is driving the needs high again. You can also look at COVID-19 hospital bed needs to get a sense of what's happening right now. This week, there are 32 countries facing exponential increases in the need for COVID beds. And I do mean exponential. The countries on this list with red dots are facing more than 10 times the need for oxygen beds to treat COVID patients in the next two months. Of course, there's something missing from these maps, the needs of high income countries. This is what has made COVID-19 so different from uh, most other health crises. We've had high income countries needing more of exactly the same items as low income countries at the same time. So what were the options if you lived in a country that couldn't afford to equip the hospitals? You were dependent on donations from other countries, from industry and from private philanthropy, something you have little control over in terms of timing and quality. And how quickly your government could access financing to buy the equipment for itself. 
For most of 2020, it was the WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank buying respiratory care equipment on behalf of these governments and shipping it to them. And there were many government to government and private efforts. You couldn't say any of this was adequate or organized. Gaps and duplication were inevitable and many countries missed out. It was a tip of the iceberg response. Then in February, 2021, an international oxygen emergency task force was finally established, co-led by UNITAID, a UN agency, and Wellcome Trust, a major UK-based research funder. And they quickly mobilized hundreds of millions of dollars to help many countries afford more respiratory care equipment. The Global Fund alone has provided $500 million for COVID treatments to over 75 low and middle income countries, mostly with US government financing. These supplies are still rolling out as we speak today. Most were bought from companies in China, the US and Europe, and they're shipped to Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Wait times can be really long. It's not unusual for equipment to arrive well after the immediate crisis is over and many lives have been lost. And of course, there's a high risk this imported equipment will break and never be repaired, lying idle. Through all of this, what about the open source medical supplies community? What were they doing? As national governments were struggling to mount an effective response and international agencies were struggling to help them, many local groups stepped into the breach working directly with hospitals and local institutions. And many of those groups are here today. While they distinguish themselves with impressive production and distribution of PPE, others demonstrated that it was possible to make oxygen concentrators, ventilators, and other equipment with open source designs, local materials, and dedicated teams. Prototypes were built, tested, and sometimes produced and used by facilities although these examples are the exception rather than the rule. As heroic as the effort was and continues to be, it's ad hoc and has proven difficult to scale. So the great promise of open source, available, affordable and adaptive, the AAA, if you like, has not yet materialized. So to close out this first chapter, we can say that at every step of the way, international, national and local, the current system has failed to prevent shortages of respiratory equipment. Many people who did not need to die have died because they couldn't get treated. And these people overwhelmingly live in low and middle income countries. As you can see from this chart, which maps COVID deaths by national income. Cases are now rising exponentially again more than 20 million each week, driven by the Omicron variant. And with 40% of the world without even one dose of a COVID vaccine, 90% of people in low-income countries don't even have one dose. How can we make this stop? How many more deaths before this is over? The cries for fundamental change, especially from low and middle income countries are loud and getting louder. Dr. John Nkengasong, the head of the Africa CDC, just a few weeks ago, called for investments in local manufacturing, not foreign aid, to help Africa, in his words, take charge of its own health security. So let's talk about the next chapter and our quest for a happy ending. In the time remaining, I want to share a vision with you. I want to throw some very tangible ideas on the table and hope that they can be dissected and added to over the next two days. And we can come out with a concrete agenda for action, even a white paper that every group here could use to simultaneously push for change in their own jurisdiction. The vision is of a global pandemic preparedness and response system with three legs, all equally powerful in their own way. The first leg is national, led by governments. The second leg is international, led by the UN and global health agencies. And the third leg is hyper-local and led by the open source medical supplies community. The vast network of maker spaces, hacker spaces, university machine shops, small batch manufacturers, startups, and many other groups 
that have the capacity to make the types of supplies that are needed urgently during a crisis. Each leg has a critical role to play to prepare for pandemics and when they hit, to mobilise quickly and in sync to minimise the damage. Each leg reinforces the other and acts as an insurance policy when one system backs up or breaks down. I'm not arguing that we replace any of the activities that are currently being done, but that we address the weak points in the current system by adding to it in very specific ways. So let's start from the ground up with a third leg, the open source medical supplies movement. Picture a world map with open source hardware hubs in every region of the world. These would be large regional centres to connect and supply national open source networks. They would be linked to regional political bodies like the African Union and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the UN. They would have regional warehouses stockpiling materials and be co-located with regional transport routes so they could deploy products quickly. Underneath the regional hubs would be national open source hardware networks, certainly in every country with a population above 20 million. These national groups would each be coordinated by a national organization backed by national legislation with the power to certify them according to national and international standards. Each group could receive designations for their capacity level and the type of expertise they have. Maybe some are PPE experts, others medical therapy devices, others diagnostic tools, or even their machine capabilities, 3D printing, industrial sewing, other types of machining, etc. This national certification could entitle the open source groups to fast access to stockpiles of materials, to expedited regulatory approval, and even to priority procurement of their products from governments and other parties during crises. The glue knitting all of this together would be open source. The open source hardware groups would be powered by a global library of open source designs, housed by a respected international authority, but not owned by it, and matched to crisis needs, pandemics, natural disasters. You want a library of design solutions well matched to the greatest threats we are likely to face. Groups would be able to modify and manufacture devices according to these designs, test them and sell or donate them, all supported by national legislation that was aligned with international regulations and consistent across geographies. The goal here is that this network would produce products quickly at lower cost and better adapted to local conditions during a global crisis. Powerful communication platforms will be needed to connect these open source hardware groups, both within and across countries. At the moment, groups are using Slack, Facebook, WhatsApp and other platforms, but much more powerful technology is needed. Because the potential size of this global open source hardware community is massive. One estimate of the, of the US alone uh, has 130 million makers, just the US alone. This size and diversity is a major strength particularly in times of crisis when you can't predict what will happen. This is exactly when you need a lot of different groups pursuing different versions of the same solution across geographies, using different materials, constantly iterating and testing, bringing many different perspectives and talents to the table in a short space of time. And the other strength of the open source medical supplies movement is its ethos of collaboration and transparency, precious and worth protecting. This is captured well by the Open Source Medical Technology Manifesto released by Public Invention for Respiricon 2. I hope you've all had a chance to read and sign the manifesto. It's available at change.org. This is exactly the type of initiative that is needed to unite this massive global community. And who would formalize and finance this global open source network? Let's go to the first leg, national governments. We've watched as even the wealthiest national governments have failed to prevent COVID supply shortages within their borders. Their current strategies, national stockpiles, legislation requiring companies to ramp up production, prohibitions on exports have not been adequate. Hospitals have still run out of supplies to say nothing of what happens to international supply when big countries put up the walls. But what if national governments everywhere recognized open source hardware as a critical part 
of national pandemic preparedness and response and invested in it. Starting with an audit of existing open source hardware groups with the capacity to produce medical supplies. Governments need to map their own open source medical supplies networks as vital pandemic infrastructure and then create the process we talked about before to assess and certify these groups according to their strengths and capacities. You could imagine a system where just like the rating and ranking of biosafety labs from levels one through four, open source hardware labs could also be rated and ranked. All of this will cost national governments money. Open source hardware labs will need government financing, grants, loans, tax and transfer incentives. And all of these should be on the table with the precise mix up to each country. They will need fast track regulatory procedures, perhaps in a category of their own, a version of the emergency use authorization in the US and other countries have their own versions. They will need legal protection and insurance. There are some promising ideas to use good Samaritan laws to protect open source manufacturing. They will need access to data. Joshua Pierce asked the question, is it tolerable for citizens to be excluded from using technologies they funded. Governments should at least make taxpayer funded research available for all via free and open source licenses. And they will need buyers for their products. Governments will have more confidence to buy from a network they have financed and private buyers, especially philanthropy, will have more faith in a system that has the stamp of approval of their national government. National governments have the power and the resources to address all of these issues. They could start by identifying an appropriate government authority to oversee this agenda. The selected agency should have ties to the military but be separate from it and closely aligned with higher education, research institutes and the reservoirs of knowledge within countries. If you want to explore some of these ideas further, I recommend the excellent open source medical supplies report design, make, protect. And now the final leg, what role for the United Nations and what we call the global health community? So far, we've talked about the central role of national governments in supporting open source hardware. But when threats transcend national boundaries, we need organizations that can push back against the conflict of interest that nation states face and which has caused so much damage during this pandemic. To avoid open source hardware networks from being dragged into this dynamic, they need to be hooked into a system of global governance under the umbrella of a UN agency or agencies. In July 2021, the Economic and Social Council of the UN, one of its six principal organs, adopted a resolution inviting the UN Secretary General to develop proposals to leverage open source technologies for sustainable development. They want to make open source information and designs more accessible via UN platforms like 2030 Connect. It's a tool for entrepreneurs, innovators, students, and anyone really to exchange ideas and technology, build networks and work together. The UN Conference of Trade and Development has even called for a central open source database. The UN Technology Bank has a tech access partnership to support local production of health technologies. And the World Trade Organization and the UN Industrial Development Organization are all making positive noises about open source. These UN agencies are all very connected to international standards and regulatory agencies. The World Health Organization is an obvious contender and a friend to the open source community. The WHO knows the limitations of the current system. A decade ago, they said the vast majority of medical devices donated to low resource settings do not function as intended and that 20% are not even used at all because there are no manuals available or because of poor user training a decade ago. And during the pandemic, WHO has been out front calling for technology transfer, relaxation of intellectual property and local manufacturing and with some success, like the new COVID mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub in South Africa and the 25 other lower middle income countries who want one so they can make their own vaccines. Finding a home in the UN for the open source medical supplies movement won't be simple. And you'll need the support of several national governments with the influence at the UN to make progress here. But there are plenty of powerful doors that are already open. I wanna stop here and wrap up. I know there's an iceberg under each of these ideas. 
but my purpose was to paint a big picture and have others react to it, challenge it and flesh it out over these two days. And maybe, maybe what we discuss here will eventually find its way into a white paper that would be the basis for a global campaign for change that we could all get behind. It's true of every global tragedy that a window of opportunity opens up for change in the waning months and for a period thereafter before it shuts. It feels like we're about to enter one of those windows now. This means it's time for bold, transformative proposals and ambitious organising. The open source medical supplies movement has so much to contribute and there is so much national governments and international agencies have to learn from it. So let's begin this great task of designing a global system that can unlock vast and distributed pools of talent, disperse knowledge, develop designs and foster local manufacturing capacity, all powered by open source, all in the service of adding another layer of protection for the public with the power to dramatically reduce the death toll from future threats. It may take a decade, but the more people and groups that respond to this call, the greater the chance of success. Thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, wishing everybody a really productive Respiricon too. Thank you very much, Leith. Um Okay, so here's a question. What international aid org orgs are embracing open source medical approaches best? That's okay. one question from Sabrina Merlo. Thanks, Sabrina. I'm not gonna answer that question because I, I, don't, know in, I don't know the full uh, sort of landscape and I don't wanna miss anyone who's doing extraordinary work. I'm gonna answer that question differently. I'll tell you who's not. <laughs> Um, which is the bigger problem. The major development organizations, and you know who they are, the major UN agencies, the major international NGOs, the more traditional architecture of, of uh, global health, none of them are. This is a world they don't know and they don't understand, which is part of the reason this conversation is so important. So when, when crisis hits, these mainstream groups who frankly have most of the finance things, so they're very powerful, they turn to traditional channels exclusively. That means that they try and buy existing products from established uh, companies, typically at the lowest price. They don't think of how to tap into the open source community. It's a parallel system and there are no bridges. And this is one of the major problems. We need to build those bridges so we integrate uh, open source into the more official uh, pandemic preparedness and res response uh, structures. I hope over these two days, there'll be lots of groups uh, speaking. You can maybe answer that question for yourself as you see the different groups speaking, um, because there are, um, you know, there are some extraordinary uh, groups that will be speaking over these two days, but I don't want to single anyone out particularly. I'd rather turn everyone's attention to trying to get the, the really big actors to take, uh, to pay attention to the open source uh, agenda. Okay, so I'm sorry, we've gotten a little behind time. I wanna make sure um, Maria Odin gets to begin right on the dot at 10.45. Lee, there are a few questions here in chat that you can probably see if you, when you calm down from your talk and have a chance to read them. Um, also, there are some in the Q&A session, which I think as a panelist, you can read. Um, to those people who ask questions, I'm sorry, we don't have time to answer your questions right now. If Leith doesn't answer them in the chat, um, she will eventually be at the speaker's table in Rehive, and you can ask her there or find her and ask again. 